But he moves on, takes the available tomorrow night. Two things are going to happen in the next two days if you're available. Tomorrow night, May 23rd, 6th, I think, St. John's College, the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass will be speaking. That's the fellow here, Ken Marks. That's St. John's College in Naples, Maryland. It's a free thing. The very next day, May 24th, here at 1 o'clock on the outside, the mayor of the city of Baltimore will be unveiled from Frederick Douglass' banner, which will go along with Frederick Douglass' walking tour here to our point. That's another free event. So all, all across the country, you know, Frederick Douglass this year is taking on a new life. So one thing I would talk to you about is this is very important, right? Because as one of Douglass' most famous quotes, you know, Douglass had so many wonderful quotes. This one says, and I guess this is something you can use to answer that, there is no Negro problem. The problem is whether American people have loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough, to live up to their own constitution. But you know, Douglas is a constitutionalist. In fact, that's how he fell out with William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison believed that this constitution was a pro slavery document. As Douglas matured, moved around the country a little more, he began to believe the constitution was against slavery. And so him and Mr. Garrison had a little falling out at that time. Okay. Quickly, the second book I talked about a little bit earlier. My bondage and my freedom. And remember, he wrote that first book in 1845. By 1855, Douglas had returned from England. He visited Rochester, New York. His home on Rochester becomes a site on the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tuckman and other freedom seekers, leaving the deep south, NC, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, they end up going to Rochester to establish the Frederick Douglass House. That became very important in 1850 when the United States Congress passed a law called the Free State Slave Law. Of the Free State Slave Act, which said anyone who aided or abetted in runaways could be imprisoned or fined at least $500. If you did not do that, you had to become now uh, what's called the abolitionists, a person who aided runaways. They were hated, and Baltimore was a hotbed of abolitionism. In fact, I would say Baltimore was where it started, because as I mentioned, William Lloyd Garrison, for most people who study American history, William Lloyd Garrison is regarded as the premier non African American abolitionist. But where did William Lloyd Garrison get his start? 1829, back in Baltimore. In fact, his mother, Fanny Garrison, had moved to Baltimore. But before William Lloyd Garrison was another abolitionist in Baltimore, his name was Benjamin Lundy, New Jersey. Perfect. He was the person who published the genius. Of universal emancipation. He did that in Baltimore in 1829. William Lloyd Garrison was a junior editor. Before William Lloyd Garrison, Baltimore held claim to have the greatest underground railroad conductor before the underground railroad was even coined as a term. His name was Elijah Tyson. And most folks do not know the history of Elijah Tyson, but you know about the Asterix Friends meeting house. The Lombard Street Reading House that moved out to North Charleston after grade school. Well, I like that Tyson passed in 1824 in Baltimore. He's the first person recorded to have freed over 2,000 slaves. And he did it all from Asterix Street and Fair Street at that Asterix Street Reading House. Now, moving on. <coughs> Douglas now, and it's amazing how small the first book is. <laughs> and how I can go through it a little better. But by 1882, he writes a song mm -hmm. called The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. And he recounts more than what's in those two first books. But in this book, he goes into even greater detail. And one of the unique things about Mr. Douglass is he had friendships with a lot of whites. A lot of whites came to his aid. A lot of whites helped him keep his five newspapers going. So, you know, he also got on the book. He wrote. He published it at different times. He became the editor of five different newspapers. One of his greatest relationships is with this fellow here. These are the wonderful books I'm going to write. After Lincoln, but my favorite is this one. This is selected speeches of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Addresses he gave. In here, Lincoln writes the letters about slavery and talking slavery. You know, Lincoln said, If I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the Union by freeing some slaves, I would do it. If I could 
hate to admit our pain, none of the pain is happy. But Lincoln, if you look at that, I'm very, very good friend. Lincoln and God does uh, almost as a best friend. And this particular here he speaks for 300 days in the Lincoln pregnancy. Why is it political? Do you think it speaks of the political and the moral? Yes. Yes, even his emancipation proclamation was political. Yeah. Because you know the wording of it, 1863, January 1st, the fine print said, I free the slaves in the states which are rebellion. in rebellion. Of course, those states had their own president, a guy named Justin Davis, and they were at war. But to the person who became known as the contraband of the war, the African American slave population, when Lincoln issued a proclamation, it sent a signal. Soon enough, slavery went in. Soon enough. And so as Mr. Douglas moves uh, about Christ, he has so much that he offered. And this one here, I share this one with you. I hope that I see the very nice portrait here of Douglas. Because of his status and because of his commitment, not just to being slave, but Douglas becomes known as the great African Remembrance. Douglas becomes, in 2014, the first person of color. The only person of color whose portrait hangs in our government's mansion. If you ever get invited to the government in the meeting, you can dwell in the government's house and you'll see his pictures by huge. And that's because of the number of maps in 2014. And so, one of the main things we thought about with Mr. Douglas is his advocacy to end the Civil War. This is the one that talks about Douglas' work on the Underground Railroad. The maps, the different routes, how people left North Carolina, South Carolina, all the way down to Georgia, made their way all the way through the Carolinas, came off to Baltimore. Bell's Point, where this city was known as a haven for runaway slaves. At the same time, it was a haven for the pirates. Because this particular place where you are today, to me, has a lot of untold and unappreciated history. So, notice when Maryland enslaved, now who knows when Maryland enslaved, but of course, it didn't happen in 1863, but Maryland was a slave state, but did not, you know, succeed its side of the union. So in 1863, Maryland slaves were not free. <coughs> now we know Maryland, all slaves ended in, all slaves ended in 1865, Maryland. But when did Maryland free its slaves? How did Maryland free its slaves? You want to have an idea? Was it 1867 or 1868? And remember, the 13th Amendment in 1865 abolished slavery in our country. So 1864. That's just 13th Amendment. Very good. Very good. Maryland, because it did not receive from the Union, in, 19, in 1863, that whole year, Maryland slaves remained enslaved, even though Maryland was fighting on the side of the Union and on the side of the Confederate Army. In 1864, January, the year after the Emancipation Proclamation, Maryland people have a murder and killed slaves. Although Baltimore, prior to the Civil War, had the largest free population of any colony in the country, over 20,000 people by 1860 were free in Baltimore. Maryland, don't, November, November 1st, 1864, ratified the Constitution for the state, and they had to vote. Now, who could vote in 1864? <laughs> 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 so think about that, ladies. How do you think, as a woman, in 1864, you couldn't vote? Now, that's white women. That's not even just black women. So when did white women get the right to vote? When did women get the right to vote? When? 1920. That's the 19th Amendment that gave the women the right to vote. So 2020 will be the 100th anniversary. Well, when the Maryland Constitution was being voted on in November 1864, there was a clause in this that stated, should Maryland abolish slavery? So who's voting then? No women. Nobody black, of course. In 1864, most of the voters were who? Maryland slave holders. And so when they voted, the slaveholders voted 
to continue slavery in Maryland by some 200 odd votes. However, some wise person in the audience said, well, we still have to count the vote of who? The slaves. The slaves are the slaves. The slaves are the slaves. Nobody black vote. Nobody. Anybody vote for white people? Ah, very good. Good student right here. What's your name, sir? You're good in class. You pay attention. Yes, 